Well, uh, I'm so happy to be here with you. I have been uh, followed the, the all sessions and it was so nice to see you and to learn more about your work, especially on this difficult time. Well, I prepared um, uh, a talk. I, I have an hour here. It's crazy because it's not a, a necessarily an a practical workshop. It's just I was. Ju I, I just want to to share with you some ideas about what I have been thinking on the data context and um, especially with some um, uh, examples of we lived this this year um, here in Brazil and especially in the favelas and the peripheries around this issue of data and the and some uh, social issues and social problems. So I'll share with you some presentation. I will talk for around, I don't know, 20, 30 minutes, and then we can just talk about some topics. Maybe you have some ideas and some other examples of uh, your um, handle with uh, data on this special time. So I will share my screen here now. Mm -hmm. Here. Okay, let's just... Um, everybody's seeing this? Yeah. Oops. So um, this presentation is more, it's not just about my experience here in Brazil, but some, some experiences and some things and some points that I'm talking, that I'm thinking about this, um, this centrality of data on our society. So maybe there's things that you already uh, know and thinking about, maybe not. So maybe it would be nice. Um, uh, everybody here, is, I think, I know, maybe some don't know me uh, a lot, but I am this guy who loves to cross the city, not a lot in these past times that we have to, to pass on our homes, but I love to do that. I love to fix things and meet people and cross encruzilhadas. And I just want to talk about this word. Ricardo knows more than me, but it's a, it's a, a, a Brazilian word or or, um, come came from the Africa-based religions, maybe, but it's a crossroads or the corners or the, the spaces on the city that um, things happened, you know, like mysteries happened and when uh, some energies get in touch. So I think it's important to place in the city and I love this place because it's when I see and when I face to the mysteries and I used to honor the, the, these mysteries. And I think this is important to face uh, our times, you know, so we are living on dystopia and you know, here in Brazil, we have this, uh, this president that is so, uh, um, that, that became our rights that we are fight a lot for many years being threatened uh, and I'm talking about basic rights of living of existence and this guy are uh, are bringing us bad times and horror times on these on on these last two years and maybe we will get more things and and more bad things on the next time and I uh, especially, I want to especially talk about favelas because it's uh, maybe it's the target of this of this trait uh, of this trait and uh, decisions policy decisions that this this president and all that around him is is target to. Uh, here in Brazil, there's more than thirteen thousand favelas. Uh, there's more than 5 million houses in the favelas. We don't know how many people live in favelas, but it's, a, it's maybe a four or, or five more than that. And just in Rio, 22% of the population lives in favelas. And uh, some official data and some official policies, uh, the official, uh, really the official policies trade uh, um, deal with this space and um, mean this space like subnormal agglomerates and I used to to use these examples always because it's it's the it's a teeny example of how um, how the official 
narratives around these places are uh, are prejudices, are distinction about the people who lives on this on these territories. That is not a, a subnormal agglomerates, but neighborhoods with a lot of diversity, with a lot a, a lot of cultural produce. Uh, a lot of policies makers, a lot of uh, collectives that participate on, on the decision of their neighborhoods and engage on all the city because there's, uh, this is the, 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 the workspace of the work class that make the society uh, run in Brazil. But it's also a, a violent place. So it's, it, there's a lot of forces, official and non-official forces, like the the uh, the narco traffic, is, as you know, and the policy that are in constant war. And this this violence is make the the, the Brazil one one of the the countries that more uh, kill in the world. So uh, every year we murdered. Um, around 6,000 people, so it's a lot. 75% of these people are uh, black. Every 20, uh, third, uh, 23 minutes, a young black man is killed in Brazil. It's a lot, it's, it's kind of absurd. A woman is murdered every two hours, it's 13 by day. And black women are twice as many victims as white women. So we must to, to face the end of the world. And I'm not talking about the fire in Amazon. I'm not talking about the lack of water because uh, if, if I start to do that, we, we won't get in, in anywhere. But, but uh, I think with everything, and although this everything, we need to have some ideas to postpone this end of the world. And I have here just, uh, um, and, and tip for you to read this, this amazing book. It's a teeny book from a great philosopher, indi indigenous philosopher here from Brazil. And he bring us with great ideas for postpone the end of the world that we are living now. And I, I think I, I have been doing that. One of my ideas for postpone this end of the world is work with data. But it's important to, to contextualize this, 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 this scenario of the data work and what we're talking about when we talk about data. So uh, on a hand, you have these three, it's a briefly points that we are faced when we are talking about data. So the data reflects reality, okay, nice. Uh, data analysis generated the most valuable and accurate knowledge, okay, nice. The results of data processing can be used to make a better decision about the world. Okay, nice. But however, these premises must be challenged and analyzed in a broader framework, you know, that considers how this new center form of knowledge production increases uh, concentration of capital, surveillance, and maybe a new way of colonization, especially for us here on the South Globe, you know? So uh, thinking about that, we started to, to, to think about some important and fundamental points when we are working with data. And uh, this is points for me is the center of our work here in Data Lab that I will that I presented to you. So we started to territorialize and, and rationalize data. This means that we get some databases and all databases that we face to, we make some cross data uh, with gender, with, with race, with territory, and trying to understand who is the person be, beyond the databases, beyond the numbers. So when we started to do that, we start to, to, to form people to engage people on diversity on data processing. And we face on a, on a field of, of data research and of data journalism that are almost white, that are almost male. And we started to think, oh, and if, if the research centers, if the, the newsrooms uh, become more black, more LGBT, more diverse, so how 
can how could we uh, uh, deal or handle with data if these spaces are more a diversity? So we started to think about da about data is a is a good bridge to monitoring public policies to know better about the reality, and maybe this data culture improve uh, citizenship, improve our our our. Our, our awareness about the world, you know, about our community, about our lives, about our bodies. So we started to work in 2016 uh, in, uh, with Data Lab, and everybody in Gig uh, has uh, followed this this story, you know, because my first gig was in 2015, and I was thinking about how to create this laboratory that work with data on this. Uh, with these concerns, with, you know, with this, uh, uh, with these um, blocks of thinking. So uh, we now we started with five young people from different favelas, and now we are almost twenty people um, from different parts of the city uh, with different uh, knowledge and. We are very nice group that are working on these points, on data journalism, on training and education process for young people in favelas to use data, to work with data, on research, almost in partnership with, with universities, and in citizen-generated data, and I will talk more about this point here, and some kind of advocacy for trying to change in, in direct way, and political way, some things. Uh, so, Especially this year, I want to talk about what we work on on this time of pandemic time, on this pandemic way, on this pandemic moment. And uh, the first thing that we that we did was okay. We will we will watch as always for how the pandemic are affecting the people who lives in favelas, the LGBT people, the people. Uh, the, the black people, and this this is this this photo is um, is especially photo from one of our our partners here, our, our our young guy, our young photographer here from Mare, the favela that we are living, that we are working, and it was on um, on the uh, this March for Black Black Lives Matter and this. Uh, this poster said the genocide has color, has social class, has address. And so our cover about the, the pandemic was with this idea. Here there's some uh, examples of some reports that we did about, um, about these issues that we are just talking uh, now at the at the other session with Hosanna and Samir and Jaspreet about uh, how it's difficult to for people, uh, for for children that lives in favelas to get access uh, uh, by internet, of internet, of these methodologies, this this technological methodologies for uh, for follow the other students and that kind of things. So we talk about the lack of water. Uh, we talk about the health care uh, of. Uh, the health, mental health, uh, uh, from uh, uh, for people that lives in favelas, and here there's some data that we visualized, like uh, the, the, uh, this this graphic just said uh, more uh, almost 60 percent of the schools in Brazil there's no there's no training pr program for for teachers, so. It was a problem for the teachers adapt themselves in the in the context of the pandemic. This is a, a, a data gif about we made some projection of if the government um, decided to open the schools, how the how the cases of 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 COVID will increase and this kind of visualize of data. But I want to 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 focus here on talking about the lack of data or the prejudice around the lack of data about COVID in Brazil. So um, during the pandemic, these numbers are oscillating, but during this year, uh, one in 10 cases is actually tested for in Brazil. 
So we had no tests. So we had no real data about about the cases, about the about the the situation. You know, in favelas, is thirty times more cases than official history. So one study made in July and just in four favelas projected that number of ninety thousand uh, 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 people had been infected who never appeared in public dashboards. So uh, we call that, um, I don't know the word in English, but it's a, it's kind of um, um, a it's um, a blackout of data, you know, because uh, we know there's a lot of people dying and we don't know where the data is. This photo is um, alternative cemetery on a favela here in Rio. So, uh, uh, we know that this, this, these problems are, uh, are caused by many things like historic public sector negle neglecting, uh, there's no sufficient water supplies, uh, there's limited resource, okay, there's dense living conditions in the, in the favelas, there's poor access to information, the, the inability to, to forego work because, uh, as I said, uh, the work class works, uh, lives in favelas, so they needed to get a bus, to get subway, to go to the work, and there's insufficient access to testing and medical care, and there's high comorbidity. But, but uh, we think to, to think about alternatives to, to, to how to to handle with that. So I want to show you this, 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 this film, this is a little video about an interesting uh, initiatives that made their own dashboard about uh, with data from the, from the COVID-19 in favelas. It was more than 15 uh, organizations from favelas, which Datalabi is one of these. And this is a nice video just to show you the reality as it is. I will put this um, this agenda here. This subtitles just to put the subtitles. Oh, fuck! Oh, sorry. Oh no. Oh, I cannot, I cannot put the, the subtitles, why not? Do you think it works in YouTube? So, because probably can have I this test, kind of... I tested here, man. Oh, now I think. Oh, oh. yes, that's it, that's it. Oh, yes, I can. Oh, fuck. Just a minute. Okay, let's go. You here? You hear the sound of the video? Quiet. It's quiet. Yeah. It's okay. It's soft. Yeah. Essa falta de ações mais efetivas do governo, como do governo federal, tem impactado bastante a população mais pobre que precisa trabalhar, precisa sobreviver. Não é de agora. Né? Muitas, muitas favelas, muitos lugares tiveram dificuldade de manter essa higienização básica por falta d'água, ou seja, falta de políticas públicas que deveriam ter sido implementadas anteriormente, não nesse momento. O número de mortes na favela, principalmente, tem a ver com essa desigualdade social e com essa ausência do Estado ou com a presença seletiva do Estado, que só, infelizmente, se faz presente a partir da polícia nesses espaços, nesses territórios. O painel unificador 
é, do Covid nas favelas, ele começou junto com uma é, necessidade apontada em uma das reuniões da CONCAD, em que várias pessoas estavam criando a presença de casos e de óbitos nas áreas de favela do município do Rio de Janeiro. Existia muito pouca visibilidade para essas informações. Ele se mobilizou né, a partir da CONCAT, né, de comunidades coletivas e de outras instituições de diversas favelas e regiões periféricas, para poder fazermos por nós mesmos. Né? E essa mobilização se dá, como sempre aconteceu, seja no mutirão para bater uma laje, seja no mutirão para poder fazer, conseguir uma água. Dessa mesma maneira, a gente está fazendo nesse contexto de pandemia. Muito claro a questão da subnotificação. Aí tem a questão do CEP, porque não tem CEP na favela, não tem CEP no beco não tem CEP na biela, ou seja, está sendo contado dentro do quantitativo do bairro, por exemplo, de Bom Sucesso e não Maré, né, de Ramos e não Complexo do Alemão. Nesse coletivo foram se juntando outros coletivos que trabalham com várias favelas no município do Rio de Janeiro, levantando dados, fazendo um apoio é, no território, né, junto à população do território. É, essas pessoas começaram a ser relatoras dessas informações dentro do painel. E a partir do momento que eu posso, tenho a disponibilidade de entrar na casa de uma mãe, entrar na casa de algum parente favelado, fazer essa articulação e pedir para que eles preencham aquele dado. Muitas vezes a internet ela não chega na favela, a gente sabe disso. Quando ela chega, ela chega de forma precarizada. Então, essa articulação ela precisa ser feita com vários braços. É importante ressaltar que o painel também traz o formulário da autoavaliação, porque no padrão da OMS, da Organização Mundial de Saúde, a gente tem que contar os casos de subnotificação ou suspeitos. Porque ali, como não se está fazendo a testagem em massa da população, uma pessoa com sintoma, ela pode vir a ser um caso. E esse dado é essencial para a produção de políticas públicas de combate à pandemia. Então, foi pensando nesse sentido que se teve a ideia do painel. E, mais recentemente, a gente está fazendo o levantamento a partir dos dados de CEP, né, da localização do CEP pela Secretaria Municipal de Saúde do município do Rio de Janeiro, e fazendo uma área de influência na, na, nos limites dos territórios de favela. A área de influência é importante porque, muitas vezes, dentro das áreas de favela, a gente não sabe o CEP, né? e muitas vezes a gente perde essa informação na prefeitura. Né? A informação é fundamental para a gente poder pressionar o Estado, para a gente poder conscientizar as pessoas, participem das pesquisas, respondam, não, não se negue a, a poder responder um formulário que vai ser importante para a gente. Ter essas informações é fundamental. Para o poder público, né? para a sociedade civil poder cobrar também o poder público, a gente precisa ter a informação, e quanto mais precisa essa informação for levantada, melhor vai ser para as tomadas de decisões conjuntas. Então, eu acredito que o painel, nesse momento, ele seja primordial. Eu já convido vocês para preencherem. Quem precisar, quem quiser conhecer mais sobre o painel COVID-19, é só acessar as redes. Os dados mais confiáveis, a gente vai conseguir enfrentar melhor a epidemia. Well, um, that's it. Uh, let's see here. Oops. Mm. And so that's it. This is, I think this is an initiative, a nice initiative that, and one of the, the, the most uh, important that we work with because uh, it it is um, it is a, a consortium of organizations of local organizations to 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 go to the houses of the people and try to to explain how how relate uh, their own uh, situations health situation was important to to get public policies. Uh, this is a. Uh, uh, another initiative closer than that uh, than, than th this other but I think it's in interesting because it's started when when people because when uh, the the pandemic starts here in Brazil a lot of organizations in favela started to to make uh, to make some alternative delivery programs delivery of food of 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 non uh, 
perishable food, you know, like we call here basic baskets. It's baskets of, of, of non-perishable food that, um, that people we started to, to deliver for poor families. And it's, uh, it started a lot in the, in the beginning of the pandemic because people lose their works and the economy goes down. So, uh, and this was an opportunity to, to some of these groups, these collectives, it started to, to face with the, with the cases of, of, of COVID that won't, won't come to the official data because people don't have access to hospitals or many different uh, variables. So they started to think, oh, maybe we can count the, the people who are with symptoms, people who are dying, because people was that people death a lot, you know, like, and, and don't know the reason, the real reason, like, oh, my grandmother uh, passed away last, last week uh, without, uh, with, with problems to, to breath, and they don't know if the, this is COVID or not, but, but probably yes, you know, so uh, maybe, and so they started to count these cases like, oh, maybe it, it, it was COVID, maybe not, and it start, they started to, to build another database. And, and I think this, this, uh, these initiatives is interesting just to, uh, just to face us with this inequality on producing data and how the, polit the, the public policies are so close of them and how the pandemic even uh, killed a lot of people uh, bring us or uh, or bring more uh, more awareness around these 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 data issues, you know. But just not by COVID we are living uh, uh, in. So I want to just to finish talk about this this initiative that we hear that we have here in Datalabi, and it's our most uh, citizen generated uh, data project. Um, that called Pupu Zap, and Pupu Zap is is a number of WhatsApp that people could map uh, their own vulnerabilities on the on the sanitation problems in favela. So uh, it links with this with these SDGs, these Sustainable Development Goals, and we are trying to uh, internationalize this, this this debate here because the official data. In Brazil, about sanitation, don't uh, it is not close to the reality. So this 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 photograph is a classic photograph about favelas. There's a, a, a river here that there is used to be clean, and people and all the sewer of people get directly in the river here. And for the official data, this house has a good sanitation because they throw out their uh, their sewers you know but we know that is not a good sewer so we started to tell people just to send photos and videos uh, to a number of whatsapp to and we started to to make a new database about this problem of course is there's a lot of challenge like uh convince people to make the, the reports, like uh, people want to have their problems solved and not necessarily uh, contribute with a database, but we are trying to understand how to, how to engage these people on this data literacy for, for help uh, themselves on, on, on solve the problem in the future maybe uh, maybe in working with uh, more advocacy in a, in an advocacy way so we have a group on whatsapp we had made a, a lot of uh, reports about the lack of the water about the the sewer about the garbage and we made some uh, encounters some meetups some gatherings with uh, people that are talking about sanitation about uh, environmental uh, issues in the favela to um, to try to build more official documents 
uh, around the data, but also around the lives of, of, of people. So this year of pandemic, we, we made uh, this, this popular plan of monitoring of the, the data about uh, environment, health and sanitation in, in, in the favela. We passed the three month listening uh, 15 families during the pandemic to, to try to understand the challenges of sanitation that these families has uh, during, the, during the pandemic. So there's a lot of family, there's no water. So if you don't have water, how can you uh, uh, care uh, against or about the, 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 the pandemic uh, things, you know? So, uh, well, I, um, I, I wanted to talk a little bit about, um, about Latin America. So I started now at really last, this, this, this week I had a, a great news that I will be part on a PhD program on a university here, uh, is studying uh, the citizen generated data process in Latin America collectives, especially the, the, the collectives are uh, located in, in the peripheries areas around the Latin America. And uh, we are be part, and we are is, uh, Georgia is part of this, uh, of these laboratories and Procomo also, uh, we are part of this lab, this, these innovation laboratories around the America Latina uh, that are not working is, uh, necessarily with data, but with um, with hardware and soft open hardware, open soft software here in America Latina in in in, in collaborative uh, laboratories. We made uh, I think around five or six laboratories. Uh, on the last, at the last uh, four years, uh, to put a Latin, people from Latin America in touch, to develop some uh, ideas and prototype some ideas to solve problems in Latin America. Uh, there's all these countries there that are trying to, uh, to work together in, in different projects. And uh, by the council of my friend Anna here, I made uh, a Padlet, a, a, a map on Padlet, maybe a, a, a collaborative map uh, that I want to start to, to, to map the initiatives that work with the open data, that work with citizen generated data and different methods in different ways, especially in Latin America, but not just, not only, uh, that I think it will be nice to to improve uh, more networks on on that discussion, maybe put more people in that in that debate, and maybe change some things, and maybe had uh, more collective ideas uh, to postpone the end of the world. So that's it that I want to share with you. I talk a lot, and maybe you have some ideas, and we could share um, more than ideas, but effects and whatever. So. Thank you very much. Thank you, Jill. I am such a fan of your work and I have been from the very first time that we met and it's been amazing to see it grow. And I, I really, um, what I, I can tell you like what I think my, my total wish for um, the next steps would be. Um, and I'm sorry I haven't proposed this years ago already. I think it would be so fantastic to see this amazing um, idea that you've created, which is so powerful and so necessary scale across the whole network and across the whole world. Like how can we create data labbies at all of the gig spaces and in all of our communities to help this citizen generated um, data process and thereby regain some of our control. I think really the work you're doing is where a lot of our different works connect. And I just want to take a moment to recap from yesterday and tie in with today before I pass on the floor for any questions and comments. We had a very, I thought, very exciting meetup around um, open science yesterday and also connecting a little bit the COAC community. So, so of course, you're represented by Kathy and Anna and the open science community of Africa Osh and, and um, and the fact that 
like you know data is at the heart of, of all these processes and will be so more in the future so whether it's thinking about how to democratize scientific processes for learning reasons educational reasons like we talked about in the last session or for policy making reasons the way that you're also doing it, it kind of comes down to that common denominator which is why i think this is such a powerful idea and is relevant to all of our work no matter which part of the puzzle we're kind of working on. So this would be my big wish and, <laughs> and I would love to talk about how to make that possible. But with this, I wanna definitely open the floor for questions and comments from everyone. Anyone? I have a comment actually, because you were mentioning some, something, Gilberto, that I felt so related with when you were saying that uh, when you contact people and you try to engage them in, you know, contributing to create a, a database and these kind of uh, products, sometimes it's very hard because people might think that, you know, by contributing, those problems will be solved. And then that's exactly the same um, challenge that we have encountered which for us is connecting, you know, how we can engage citizens to contribute to this kind of um, collection of data and also see the value in it. And like recently we created also like a national and interactive map that has, was also with citizen generated data on different um, COVID solutions in different areas, you know, economy, education, citizen participation. And the first month was mainly trying to somehow convince people how this could be valuable, how they can use it, how it can benefit them. So um, it was just a comment that it's also a challenge that we have. And I think it's also about how you address it um, with them, you know, how you can present it in a way that they see the value in this and how they can use it also. For example, what you were saying, connecting it with advocacy because then you're empowering them through the data they, they're also contributing and creating and helping create these databases, you know, how they can use this data for advocacy purposes. And amazing work, Hilberto, I have already told you on our call. <laughs> and we also see so many connections with the COACT project that we're really super excited about taking these conversations forward and see how we can collaborate and, and connect the geek community doing projects similar to yours with this uh, community of practice that we want to start building in Coact. Yes, nice. Um, I think um, Ofrey, hi Ofrey, you want to talk something? And uh, just to just to comment the idea of, of Geraldine and Anna, I, we are so, uh, 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 engaged on 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 make this possible, you know, or make this this some model could be replicated. So this year, uh, a collective from another favela of young people that passed through some uh, trainings with us years ago, he started to do a new data lab on their own territories. So it was the first time that we face on the on a niche on a new initiative that that born from uh, from nothing and he started to do the same same thing, but for their own territory. So I think we will learn how to how to talk more about that and how can we share methodologies to to, to bring more data labs on, on many different uh, territories, on many different spaces and and and, and sizes, you know. So um Jill, do you uh, sorry, do you want to you already said Ofre would like to go next, right? Yeah. Uh, do you listen to me? Yeah. Are you listening to me? Okay. So, Gilberto, it's, it's nice to, to hear about your work. And uh, my question is regarding with this kind of peer-to-peer -peer connections. I mean, for example, the, the uh, innovation map you are doing is like something that is being proposed and done, kind of done again and again and again, but it doesn't scale for some reason. I, I, don't, know, I don't understand why, but it's like we are kind of repeating ourselves in a way. I mean, there is a lot of innovation. There is a lot of, of valuable work, like the one that you are doing. But we are, I don't know, like again making the map, again making this kind of stuff. So for me, for me, is how can we scale or or create this kind of momentum? Maybe it's not about like having like a big scale. Maybe it's not about that. It's more about keeping momentum because I think that all this innovation is happening and popping up all around the world. 
but it's not well connected. I think that maybe we can, but it's just a HANA hypothesis. We can try to make some kind of like one-to-one -one connection to keep momentum and try to scale that in a one-to-one -one fashion, just one point at a time. But do you have any kind of, uh, I don't know, strategy or something like that to, to think about how can we articulate and keep momentum in these innovation initiatives? Nice, Frey. Um, it's so nice to see you here, man. We share some great moments. <laughs> and uh, thank you for your question. It's, uh, it's, an it's, it's an important question that many people uh, made us, and it's about the scale, of course. And um, let me see. I think we could arrange some or figure out this uh, this this issue this problem maybe um, uh, maybe is, is, uh, make our network is stronger and I I say that because as a project this is a local project you know and our our challenge now it's focused or really focused on on try to solve the, the local problem you know like we have a community that has a hundred thousand forty a hundred a hundred forty thousand people that lives here in Mare. so it's a lot of people and we have 50 we have 50 points we have 50 reports in two years of work it's like whoa we are we, we are not we are not uh, getting success on the making the on, on 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 improving the map and improving the database because the idea is is what Anna says is try to it's try to get on the on the city hall you know it, it's try to get on the city councillors and and said uh, me i or woman i have here a problem you know the the official data is not it's not real so what can we do for for our community and in face of the other community seems like ours so we are now trying to work to make this happen, you know, to make this success. So when I think when I think in 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 open in in replicate the thing, I think uh, maybe we just can share methodologies. How can uh, the challenges we have, or I don't know, you know. But yeah, just 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 a comment. It's like it's not about the scale. I think that the, the important uh, uh, sorry, is something is hammering. But anyway. I, I think that the important thing is not is not the scale but momentum. Maybe uh -huh. these, these initiatives are valuable because they are small, they are fo focused. Uh, but I think that we, at least in the in the local uh, space, we lack momentum. It's, it's kind of a like a, I don't know like a, sp a spike, and after that flat, after that a spike. So we have problems not in scale. This this is not my concern, but in articulation and momentum. Do, do yes. you have any? ideas on that yes i think we um i think this this networks is, is served for that you know man i think we are trying to to make this on 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 this on this on these laboratories on, on Latin America, like I said, these lab, these labics, uh, we we participate on all these labics, trying to uh, trying to put on on even the the super nerd and the super maker project some things about about good way to use data, about good way to use the technologies, you know, to try to to try to to engage more people around the the, the issue. So I think we are. Uh, we not we we do not have a, a straight strategy, but we are trying to to get on more networks like this hour and 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 the things. But I think we can we can talk to to have more ideas and good ideas to how to do that. Um, I don't want to monopolize because I've already said something, but I would like to share something a little bit about my work in Berlin here on that. But would anybody else like to speak first? Go ahead. Okay, well, definitely the one for the rest of you. Um, so why I think it relates to all places. Um, we in Berlin have now the, there's going to be a new smart city strategy written for the city. And um, and it's quite wild, you know, in a, in a city like this, if you start sort of digging beyond the surface of how the IT of a city like this works, it's quite shocking, really. 
And I know I complain about German government a lot, but it's <laughs> particular in Berlin. And this is true also for other cities, although Hamburg maybe is an exception where they get it right. So for instance, there they started introducing data sharing plans with mobility providers who come into the city and say, you need to share the data with us so we can do better traffic management, not the people data, but like where e-scooters yeah. are thrown, for instance. Um, in Berlin, a lot of our infrastructure data is owned by one company, which is Siemens, and then they don't want to give it. So even though it's public data in the sense that they, you know, do public service infrastructure provision, they don't want to share the data. I'm simplifying a little bit, but it's basically that's how it is. So this idea that you have your own data narrative and the ability also, uh, like, of course, we're not going to go laying new pipes, but like Offer said, it's also a concept, you know, that needs to be introduced and an idea. And so it's, um, I think, as relevant here as it is in other places to build up this momentum. And I know there are some initiatives that are kind of taking off the ground, which is also why I'm really interested in seeing if we can maybe create some more momentum or more projects together around this. There's a UN Habitat initiative, which is kind of working with the same idea that Francesca Brio is working in um, Barcelona and Amsterdam to create smart citizens, not smart mm -hmm. cities, and they're starting a new effort on this line. And I think this is something we could really well tap into on this sort of UN habitat level. Um, but I think there's also more and more sort of coming out around this. And it's a topic I'm really passionate about. So I would definitely love to explore more ways to see how can we do these things on a very local and, and grassroots level, but make sure we connect to create that momentum. Now I talk for ages. Okay, off back over. Yes, I think I think that's it. I think we need to, I think what maybe it was Ofre wants to say, you know, how can we in local places, in local, uh, in local examples, in local projects, how can we uh, build some, some, some bigger, some more um, spread, you know, I think we can, we must do that. And I think we are, we have everything to do. Yeah. And maybe just one more note. Um, I also really love that we were able to do the session and that Anna and Kathy could join because I know that you already had some exchange on your work, but I really feel also this is so relevant for everything we're talking about at COACT and it would be very nice. I mean, I'm, I'm just going to say it now, unfortunately, no, none of the other consortium members showed up, but I think this is the kind of thinking that we're trying to feed also amongst our project partners and to see how we can connect the conversations there. So. We'll try to find more ways to keep doing that after this and definitely share your talk with them, which was really fabulous. Thanks so much for giving that today. Thank you, people. Thank you very much. Let's do more applause. <laughs> <laughs>